So, so <laughs> who has the City Skylines route? Who is that? I am. Good man. I am City Skylines. Good. I, man, like when I was a kid, I grew up on like SimCity 2000, mm. man. <laughs> you laugh, man. That was high tech stuff that back is, in the day, though. man. It's like there were clouds. Um, <laughs> I know. Mm. No, my 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 significant other often will turn over and see me just like <laughs> expanding my city slightly. Yes. And saturated with bus stops. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely saturated. I know. It doesn't cost anything really in the game. No, so it's so cheap. All it the is bus so stops. cheap. I love it. <laughs> Welcome to the internet. Live from the Marriott Library at the University of Utah, this is the Red Line Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Dunstan, and these are my co-hosts... Kyle Holland and... Alex Fielder. Today we're talking transit advocacy with Curtis Herring, the Executive Director of Utah Transit Riders Union. Say hi, Curtis. Hi, everybody. We'll talk about advocacy, what the UTRU does, and our thoughts about transit along the Wasatch Front. All this after the news. I'm putting in the actual sound effect. I know, because I actually time. sent it over. I don't know, I like the BB. So there's some bad news this week for the long-anticipated REM project in Montreal, as several safety issues have been discovered in the crucial Mont Royal Tunnel which is a critical piece of infrastructure for the new network. Contractors and the CASE, the agency responsible for the project, are now saying that the REM's opening will be delayed until at least the end of 2024. Uh, And I do have some notes here for the news. Uh, If you are a Canadian news person and you're listening to this, please stop calling the REM light rail. I don't know why, but Canadian papers will call anything that is not a traditional heavy rail subway light rail, like anything. This is such a North American thing, like everything is light rail. (laughs) Everything. Everything. You want a transit system? Here's some really long light rail lines. (laughs) Yes, my favorite, you know, 84 mile Seattle link project. Oh boy. Uh, In more positive news, the double tracking project on Indiana's South Shore commuter line is moving ahead this week. The project includes includes improvements along a roughly 27-mile section of track, including removing 21 grade crossings and adding five new stations. Unfortunately for fans of Wacky Transit, the project will also remove the infamous street running section in Michigan City, long an object of interest among rail fans. This has been the news. So, Curtis, um, would you mind telling us a bit about your background, like um, day job, education, all that kind of stuff? Sure, all the fun stuff, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Curtis Herring, born and raised in Salt Lake City. Um, yes, yes. Uh, so, Like within actual city limits? Like actual legit oh, city limits. Dude. I grew up in Rose Park on the west side, oh. man. No, so uh, went to the West High School where I <laughs> took the 19 and 20 bus. That was my first experience with mass <laughs> transit. Uh, then came up here to the University of Utah, graduated back in 07. Back in my day, the train stopped at the, the stadium. <laughs> you kids with it all the way up to the, the hospital, I don't know what to do. So, we also had a golf course <laughs> instead of parking lots over there. But yeah, so graduated in political science uh, back hey. in 07. Yeah, all the cool kids graduated in political science. <laughs> but um, in that time, uh, through like the Hinckley Institute up here in U, uh, I also had the opportunity to work in Washington, D.C. for some time. Fell in love with the metro out there. It's a great (laughs) system. Absolutely fantastic system. Uh, Came back here. uh, Worked on a lot of political campaigns where I advocated for, amongst other things, uh, transit and better transit options, uh, especially along the Wasatch Front. Uh, Currently, uh, I live in Bountiful uh, with my significant other, three cats, and a child that doesn't know how to put plates away. (laughs) Um, And uh, live in Bountiful, work up in Ogden for my day job, where I'm actually a program manager for a nonprofit that helps oh, yeah. persons with disabilities, uh, where I take Front Runner to work pretty much every day. Uh, and then it's either e bike or they're switching us over to the uh, micro transit down in Bountiful. <laughs> I have thoughts about oh, that. Oh, well, that's <laughs> good because we made we, I oh, made specific yeah. space because I'm sure I'm sh- there, that I have you have thoughts. a thought. I have many thoughts. <laughs> so, but take the train up to work every day. Uh, I'm one of those dreaded commuters. However, Ooh. I know it's the worst, but uh, try to use, obviously, trends as much as possible. However, living in Bountiful, living in a suburb, despite it being 
one city away. Try to use it as best I can, but man, it's difficult. Man, it's not fun. Oh, I know. Um, I used to commute to Bountiful yeah. from here at the U, and that was what, like yeah, an hour and a half? An hour and a half of fare. Oh, it's easy. Like 10 miles. Oh, yeah, yeah. easy. Like <laughs> as the crow flies, right? Like even just planning out my trip here, yeah, I could take the train to get here. But if I miss my bus by five minutes, I'm getting home at 9.30, 10. Uh, that's part of the reason why I'm advocating. One of the reasons that uh, I've been an advocate for better transit and decided to start working with you, True, uh, back in February, late March. So you're a bit of a lifelong transit rider. Then. I am. Much more than, you know, all of us who, me, I started like a year ago. I don't know about that. Same. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, unfortunately, transit ridership has to be a decision, right? It has to be something that, for the most part, you have to have a reason you want to do it, and especially in North America, oh, yeah. especially, especially in the West. Um, Heck, even here, and according to some bus drivers I've talked to, we have some pretty darn good bus service. We do, actually. Comparatively comparatively speaking, yes, uh, in the West, uh, especially west of the Mississippi, Salt Lake UTA has a decent system, comparatively speaking. Comparatively. Comparatively. It's always like that big giant asterisk right (laughs) on top of that, right? And so... Yeah, and so lifelong transit rider. I have my car. I hate my car. I need my car. It's 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 one of those things. It's a, it's an abusive relationship. Right? Um, Not oh. quite as bad as Connor, who oh. has a car and doesn't even need it. Oh, you just like to look at it. No, nah, you just wax the hood. I, I just, just, like, oh, I just like to walk outside my apartment sometimes and just wow, that sure is a car. That is a car, all right. It's got wheels and everything. It still has the same gas it's had in three months. <laughs> it, it, I haven't filled up in like four months whenever my parents ask like how much is gas and so like I'm like I don't know (laughs) (laughs) probably more than a gallon of milk Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, I noticed that you mentioned that you sort of have an or a background in advocacy. Mm-hmm. So would you go over that a little bit, and then how that's sort of transferring over to your work with you True? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I mean, growing up in on the west side of Salt Lake City, um, I, I was luckier than most, and I'll say that, and I'll own my privilege, and I know I have it. Right. Like both of my parents went to college. I went to college. I got a decent job out of it. But I saw a lot of the people that I went to school with that weren't so lucky. Uh, And unfortunately, that's only gotten worse as time goes on. Uh, And so advocacy, in in one way, shape, or form, has always kind of been a part of my life, whether it be um, wages, whether it be equality rights, uh, whether it be, in this case, access to transit. Because transit, the ability to move around, is the ability to build yourself up economically. Right. If you can't get to a job, you can't get a paycheck. If you can't get a paycheck, you can't spend a paycheck. If you can't spend a paycheck, you're You're in trouble. You're in trouble. (laughs) Exactly. And so advocacy for me is very much fighting for people's ability to advance themselves in life, whatever it may be. Transit has always been near and dear to my heart. Um, Growing up in Salt Lake, I remember when the air was terrible, traffic was terrible. So I mean, the air is still It's terrible. still terrible. And traffic's still terrible. It is. <laughs> but you ask any Republican up at the state legislature, and they'll tell you it's gotten better. Uh, theoretically. Theoretically, the numbers say it, but I still don't like to breathe the air in July. Or what in, is it, like a smoking a cigarette a day, breathing the air or mm-hmm, something? Pretty much. Well, um, now we got the weird lake dust, not just the tailings. The, from the, from, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so advocacy very much is a way to help people help themselves. Part of that is the ability to freely move, and part of that is creating transit systems that are accessible, affordable, go where you need to go, when you want it to go, comfortable, uh, and empowering. Because if some of those are there and others are not, or some of those are inadequate, you're not going to have an optimal system. And those are some of the things that you true is fighting for, um, is to be the voice of the writer, wherever they may be. Lovely. I like the way you talk. Yeah, look. Yeah. Like I said, I you have the degree in political. I know. I've been doing this politics <laughs> thing for a while. I can I can charm you as much as I want. <laughs> Sell you a used car. Uh, can you go over and bring all this charm to UTA's leadership? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, to be honest, the thing about UTA. Let's, well, no, let's talk. You got to be careful because I can get fired. So no, no, no. That, that's a wink, wink. Here's <laughs> here's the here's the thing about you, True, as the Transit Riders Union, as the voice of the rider. We talk to UTA. Um, we talk to uh, public outreach. We talk to the board. We talk to them. Uh, and what I always like to remind them is the phrase I like to use is adversarial ally. 
Oh. We want to make sure that we are holding UTA accountable. We want to make sure that we are saying, why are you making these decisions? Why are you doing what you're doing? A lot of times it's budget, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I'm firmly convinced no one gets a job at UTA because they hate buses and they hate trains and they love cars and they want it. Like, th- you get a job there because you care about transit, right? But they have their restrictions. Uh, and so they are going to make decisions based off of those restrictions. And we are going to either say, yes, that's a good decision, or what are you doing, microtransit? <laughs> uh, sorry, I got something caught in my throat there. But being that adversarial ally, really making sure that we are providing that voice, I think is key to making a better system overall. And I should mention, obviously, UTA is the big kahuna, right? It's the giant one. But true is the Utah Transit Riders Union. There are other systems, as I know you guys know. Yes. Um, and I know you had like Mike Christensen on a couple of weeks. He's a board member yes. for true. He has his vision as well. You true cares just as much about getting someone from Logan to St. George as they do about improving Second South between State Street and you know Third East or oh, whatever it is. I'm very much so um, to yeah, and so. <laughs> We want to make sure that we're that voice, uh, and we the, want to make sure we have that communication. That's good. We really need that because you can't even get from here to Logan without no, no. paying out your out your ears <laughs> yeah, right now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> very, very uh, tasteful change in language there, Kyle. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So before we move on to the UTRU, what, what routes do you frequent besides besides Front Runner? Obviously, like four fifty five, probably. Yeah. Like, um, so I, I I got my first of all I got my uh, my e-bike back in February, mm. so I become a big fan of that. Nice. Um, big fan of that. Yes. Especially with where you live. Don't yes, no. our, our best grid. Yeah, no, it's it's a pain, to be sure, and I feel <laughs> like, you know, you have to kind of be a road warrior to handle that a little bit. But <laughs> um, They're taking out my F605. Uh, they're replacing it with the microtransit. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, the 455, 470 is another frequent one I use. Um, when I am in town, I will use the red or green, mostly, uh, occasionally the blue. So, yeah, it just depends on where I'm going. Cool. cool. Yeah. Sweet. And one more route question sure. for you. Being born and raised in Rose Park, no. what are your thoughts on the one? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting look we're getting there. <laughs> I'll put it this way. Rose Park has always been kind of underserved. And though I appreciate efforts to optimize. I feel that 19 and 20, which have always been there forever, have served the area as well. Changing it up, adding new routes, adding microtransit, all this sort of stuff, I feel is unnecessary in an established neighborhood. Um, And I mean, we'll see how it goes, I guess is how I'll put it. All right. Yeah. I hope it goes well because that's I like hope so too. that's the area where they're being most aggressive. Yeah. Cutting uh, out things that are old and putting in like a couple different things. Yeah. I think 19 and 20 are tried and true. So maybe just up the frequency on them would be a better option. I love upping frequency in general. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Um, so would you mind going over a brief history of YouTube? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so you true it, well it was born out of frustration <laughs> to be perfectly honest with <laughs> yeah, you yeah that makes sense yeah it sounds about right like all good things like all good things are born out of, all, all advocacy things are born out of frustration but um, back in 2013 2014 the idea started to kick around of having a transit riders union this was back in the day when specifically UTA was taking trips to Switzerland um, spending money in, in interesting ways shall we say uh, had a seven-member board and, and were making decisions that, at the time, a couple of the founders didn't feel were really in the best interests of transit riders at all. They were more interested in getting their trips to Switzerland and, and <laughs> attracting uh, rail companies to come to Salt Lake. And so that's kind of where it started. Uh, officially became an organization back in 2015. Uh, in 2015, we started some advocacy programs um, specifically aimed to raise awareness to policymakers uh, about transit or the lack thereof. Uh, Specifically, we had like the seven day challenge uh, where we would challenge members of the UTA board and policymakers to take transit for a week. (laughs) I like that. You see, I've 
feel like that should sort of be if you if you're in charge of a transit agency, maybe that should be your default mode of transportation. You'd think so, but I guess not. <laughs> but but you have to remember, like these decisions were being made by people who lived in the suburbs, by state policymakers who probably either are severely underserved or not served at all by a UTA bus route, let alone a train route. And um, maybe their their closest stop is, you know, a quarter or half mile, three quarters of a mile away. And, and we still see this issue today, and I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, so we issued these challenges. We started to grow membership. And then I don't know if you heard, but we had a global pandemic. Heard of that. Yeah, yes. it, it happened. It Weird. was a thing. Um, transit ridership dropped. Um, board members dropped off. It, it, we disappeared, basically, for lack of a better word, for the past couple of years. Uh, and so now you true is in a bit of a renaissance and a rebirth. Uh, they they brought me on. Like I said, my history is with advocacy and that political sort of background. Um, and so they brought me on back in February. We are in the process of rebuilding. Um, I like to say like we're six months into a new nonprofit. Like we've got all the documents, <laughs> we've got all the papers, we got all that good stuff. Um, but we are rebuilding um, mostly by making cringeworthy memes on Twitter. Which are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Those are the brainchild of, of me on the train going north. <laughs> um, but uh, rebuilding membership, rebuilding those relationships with UTA, with policymakers. Uh, and where we're currently at is we're trying to build up our membership once again. We just filled our board again and really looking forward in the future on how we can reach out to like-minded organizations, um, not necessarily transit focused, but we're talking about like clean air, um, sure. clean water, uh, general walkability, neighborhood, uh, community councils, all of that sort so of stuff. So like Sweet Streets, mm-hmm. Better Utah, mm-hmm. people like that. Exactly, okay. exactly. So that's where we're at now. Would you say that the reset was good for the organization? You know, I think in some ways it certainly is. Transit right now, both locally and nationally and internationally, I think really is at a crossroads. No pun intended, I suppose. <laughs> um, but, but... You could say it's at a grand junction. There we go. Hey. There we go. It's at a union station. Um, <laughs> but transit really is a point right now where people are starting to realize that transit's an option again. I know, it blows your mind, right? And, and what I mean by that is, just bringing it back down to the local level... I see it on the train every day. People are riding their bikes. They're taking. They're actually walking to the station. They're they're doing the parking rides. And and when they get on the bus, people are are more people are on the bus. Right. Part of that's because yeah, gas is five bucks a gallon. That's not fun. But part of that too is they realize that this is a community asset that exists that works if if you do it right. And so what Utree wants to do is say, yeah, it works if we do it right. Let's make sure it does it right more often, right? <laughs> Let's make sure that we make it as easy as possible. So to answer your question, I think in some ways the reset is a good thing um, because it says, hey, we have this new starting to move into this post-COVID world where maybe, just maybe, driving isn't the only option to get where you want to go. Uh, you know, during COVID, when they started opening up streets to pedestrians, when they started to Um, make it easier to get around your community, encourage you to get out more uh, because people were cooped up. If we can use that, if we can transition that into this is the new normal, I think U-True and and other organizations across the country like U-True are well positioned to to really make a difference going forward. Well, and I would say that this is a um, particularly crucial time for that sort of action, given that we have like, you know, uh, eight years to stop, like, the literal end of the world or whatever. Minor <laughs> detail. Minor, minor detail. Minor detail. Don't worry about it. Just turn up your air conditioning a little bit more. It'll be right. fine. Uh, until I uh, can't just... breathe because the, the air is chewy. <laughs> <laughs> this is how this is how I know you weren't born and raised. So. Well, you see, <laughs> it, we got our own air quality issues in Boise. I'll that's tell true, you that. <laughs> but, yeah, we're not, we're not quite as... Thankfully, not, not as bad yeah. yet. Yes. <laughs> give, yeah. it, give, it, give it 30 years. Yeah. So I know that you guys didn't have, like, you know, all that long as a thing before mm-hmm. the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. Um, but what would you say, like, is the sort of greatest success of you, True before, you know, everything went to sure. trash? Uh, <laughs> before everything went to trash. Well, <laughs> actually, so I, I'd point to probably our two biggest successes. Probably, first of all, yes, was the, the seven-day challenge. So a lot of people participated. Uh, in that we day. had a fair amount of policymakers actually participate, actually said, huh, <laughs> there you go. 
Uh, this isn't quite what I thought it would be. Um, so that was the first one. The second one is we actually had a board member uh, on YouTube sit on the UTA board. Oh, we did. Nice. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Alex Cragen. Um, and so he was actually on the board uh, of UTA right up until they decided, the, the state legislature decided to redo everything and, and say, okay, well, we're doing away with this board. We're doing a three member panel now. Um, but that was that was quite the coup, if I do say so myself. Oh, I would um, say so. That's like getting a man on the inside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And so um, <laughs> Alex currently is on Sweet Streets, for example. Yes. Actually, he's a personal friend, but um, is an example of that happening. And so as far as what U-True has been able to achieve, that's definitely been part of it. And then there's been kind of offshoots based off of that. Um, but going forward, it definitely provides a blueprint for what U-True can achieve. One of the things that I want to see us starting to do as we build up membership is get people on community councils, get people on mm. planning commissions, mm. get people, um, especially in like some of those smaller towns, get them on their transit boards, create a citizens advisory council within UTA that um, exists so you know we would be on the outside but they'd be on the inside right? <laughs> um, and and so uh, there's definitely a lot of successes that we've had in the past and I think there's a lot of potential uh, for what we can do in the future yeah well and I mean uh, those community councils um, I'm sure you've heard about what happened in the avenues a few weeks. No, was there a thing? There was a thing. They wanted to have like all the buses down all the streets all the time. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> not quite. If if well, I'm I don't mistaken, understand that. They, they, Why wouldn't they, they, wanted, they want that? They wanted buses, uh-huh. but only if it didn't go on their streets. Wait, I don't understand. But the buses go on streets. But that's <laughs> that, that's bad because it. it might, Do we have hover buses now? Is we, that a thing? Yeah. The, yes. But, oh, sweet man. But I'm, no. I, no, I'm sure you heard about yeah, that. No, I, and, yeah, no. Yeah. In the trib and all that yeah, nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, that lamestream media, yes, I heard <laughs> but, but, I mean, just the fact that those community councils mm-hmm. in every city in probably the Wasatch Front mm-hmm. are have just have these really nimby tendencies. Mm-hmm. It's just so important that we get, mm-hmm. like, you know, people who aren't having nimby tendencies yeah. on those. Yeah, and I mean, here's the thing. is You can say in every city along the Wasatch Front, but in actuality, you could say in every city full stop. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and But here's the thing, and here's why that is, right? Like, every single community council is populated with people who own houses, Right. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm 38 and I still live in a condo and all that good stuff. Yes. I know, yeah. I know. Those community councils, unless you reach out, unless you work towards it, unless you show an interest, are going to be populated by people that have lived there since Brother Brigham founded that city. <laughs> you know, founded that location and it was carried down from generation to generation. And and they are they are inherently going to hate any idea that does not match what keeps my home value up, whatever that means in their brain, um, whatever keeps the riffraff out. Um, And and the rest of us are sitting back and going, it's a bus that allows people to get around your community. You could ride the bus. You could take the bus to get to where you wanted to go instead of driving your car. And so to have those voices uh, on community councils, that's another thing that I'm going to be working towards is advocacy and actually training people once we start to get to that phase, which I'd hope to do by the end of the year, is really start to train people on how to advocate, how to get on those community councils, how to speak to the nimbiers of the world. <laughs> um, and so through those actions, I mean, the smallest unit of transit is the individual. And um, walking or taking a bike or a car or a bus or whatever, they will make those decisions based off of whatever mix of, of reasons entered into that. But if we can have those voices on those community councils speaking to that, saying, no, a bus going down the street is not the end of the world, it but will it be might fun. Rattle, it might rattle my windows, Curtis. As, a, might, as, opposed, what, as, opposed, of the, as opposed to the 15, 16 cars per minute that are passing by or but one the, bus every 15? But, but the bus yeah, I, is scary. I know. It's big. <laughs> and it's, it has words on Whoa. it um, <laughs> as opposed to my bumper stickers. But, but if people aren't showing up and, yeah, I'm being snarky, obviously. Yeah. But, it, but having those conversations about the actual benefits of transit, whatever those may be. And that's the other part of it, too. What? What works in the avenues as far as those conversations are concerned are different than Rose Park, are different from South Jordan, are different from Bountiful, are different from Ogden, are different from Ephraim, Utah, or or Lehigh, or Beaver, Utah, right? Those conversations are different depending on where you are, and you know your area best. 
Uh, and so, yeah, you true can provide guidance. You true can say this is generally what's going on. But you know your neighborhood. And if we can advocate for that and teach you how to do it yourself, that's you true's mission as well. That'll be really good to see because mm -hmm. then you'll have both pieces of the transit puzzle because UCA can't get a bus into a neighborhood if the neighborhood's violently fighting against yes. it. <laughs> and a neighborhood like, say, Rose Park can't get their hands on better bus service mm -hmm. without UCA's buses. Mm -hmm. So if you can get both of those working towards the direction of positive change, mm -hmm. maybe we can actually get some damn bus service around here. Right. Well, and that's the allied part of the adversarial allies. We want to help UTA be we want you yeah. to have. We want you to have so much money that you we can want to give you all 400 money. buses mm -hmm. down every street every all three seconds. Time. Yeah. Uh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> that, that's a dream. Yeah. So are there any plans by the union to expand public awareness of its existence? And if so, how are you looking to go about that? Yeah, because um, I don't know how I manage this, considering that I just spend all of my free time, you know, pouring over transit stuff because I'm a nerd. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I did not know you guys existed mm -hmm. until you followed me on Twitter. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I mean, before I joined, I was vaguely aware that it was a thing. Um, but until I happened across the posting and like I knew the guy who was posting it, and uh, yeah, I didn't know that U True was up and running again. It's a legitimate question. We have several wings that we are doing outreach and advocacy through. Part of that, yes, is snarky memes on Twitter. <laughs> of course. Um, but part of it too is that outreach again to like minded organizations that already exist. We're in that process right now of actually starting to reach out and say, hey, Either you didn't know U True existed in the first place or you thought U True was dead and gone. We are back. <laughs> we want to reach out. We want to work with you. We want to ally with you uh, to, to help your projects and, and just your general mission. Because, again, you know, the projects of Sweet Streets, for example, or, or Rail from Logan or St. George, those all fall in line with what U True wants to do. We just want to make sure that the transit rider is uh, uh, known and appreciated. There's that portion of advocacy and outreach. There's also the portion where we're earning Mern Media by, like, showing up on podcasts, for example. Um, uh, him, him. You know. And, Not and, saying what. No, you know, but, like, showing up and reaching out and actually talking to people and, and letting people know that you true exists. Uh, through those means, lots of our end medias, we're going to be starting to do like letters to the editor, like the old people stuff, oh. letters to the editor, um, responding like, for example, uh, Representative Schultz, he's the House Majority Leader, not terribly long ago came out and said, um, I don't understand why anyone would want free transit. Oh, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, don't, but only slightly. I don't know why people would want free transit. You know, it doesn't benefit anyone. Well, and in his defense, he lives two and a quarter miles from the bus stop. For him, it doesn't benefit him or the people in his community. So it's easy for his brain to go, blah, doesn't help anyone, right? And so we want to be that counter voice and, and do the old fart stuff and, and, like, respond in the newspaper when those types of things happen, respond online, and, and again, build awareness and build advocacy through those routes as well. Uh, and so... Uh, it's a it's it's basically a coordinated digital campaign, print campaign, as well as outreach campaign. Um, and then in community, we we weren't able to respond quick enough this go around because again, I've been here for all of four months, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, we're still rebuilding, but the next time an avenues complains about <laughs> uh, a bus route or things like that, um, we want to make sure that you choose there and represent it as well and say, hey, we exist too. So that's how we're starting to rebuild membership. That's how I'm starting to rebuild and reach out is, is, is through those sorts of actions. Um, I would love not only to have every single person who ever rode the bus or ever rode the train to be on you true, but I also want to make sure we're reaching out to the future writer that doesn't exist yet because that's often a piece that is missed. We always like to talk about the current writer and, and what their needs are, and that is definitely important. But that grandma who thinks that the bus going down the street, if we can show her that there are benefits to transit, um, there are benefits to having that bus go down the street, and get her on that bus for the first time, and we can turn her into a U-True member, for example. Hearts and minds. Hearts and minds, exactly. That's a good way of putting it, is, is build by doing is, is how we're going to do it thinking about the current and future writer. So, j this is a weird and random question, but do you have like, oh, do you have, <laughs> do you have a list of like how far each representative lives from like a bus stop? I do not. Okay. I could get that list, however. There is a list? <laughs> well, no. So <laughs> because I want the list. Well, so here's the thing <laughs> is um, a representative's address is public information. Ah. Um 
It's, it's, and so is the transit map. And so is the transit map. <laughs> and, you know, Google has that little bus stop thing right there. Yeah. Um, so and it's like so, a match made in heaven. Yeah. Does it exist? No. You'd have to go through 104 people, but you can figure it out. I mean, it's not impossible it. to do. That sounds like a small problem for Urbanist Twitter. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's get on that, Urbanist Twitter. Salt, yeah, Salt so. Lake Urbanist Twitter. Yeah. And some of them will be literal, like, hundreds of miles, uh, especially when you get into, like, southern Utah. Hundreds upon hundreds of miles before the closest transit stop exists. Of any sort. Of yeah. any sort. And, and that's the interesting thing about Utah is, is we are one of the most urban states, and yet we have these very rural communities that don't even know. I mean, they know buses exist, but, <laughs> but they can't never even, ridden one. Never ridden one. Don't even know how you, you know, what, what, what the heck is tapping on? I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, and, and so there's a widespread there. But... These 104 legislators are making decisions that very much affect transit, very much decide where the dollars go or don't go. Uh, and so if you can provide that perspective of, you know, the House majority leader lives two and three quarters miles from the nearest bus stop, that can inform some decisions and that can put some things in perspective. Excellent. So what are the biggest issues with transit along the front? In, in UTRU or your view, personally? <laughs> like, the biggest issues. Like, three big hits, or not hits. <laughs> Ooh, boy. <laughs> um, so, as far as, like, transit in Utah... Um, only three? Only, yeah. I mean, I mean geez, where do you want to start? We could go for hours. Yeah, but. I mean, that's the problem, right, is I, I think probably the biggest issue is, and, and it's not confined to Utah, but we seem to be especially good at it, <laughs> is we have a state legislature that's never seen a roads project it didn't love and rubber stamped, <laughs> uh, with, at best, transit being an afterthought, at best, and connectivity related to that not even being considered by UDOT um, to tie into that UDOT actually now taking over at least like rail building uh, as part of UTA. I'm cautiously optimistic with that. Um, I think there can be cost benefits to it, uh, like actual physical financial cost benefits to it. And they do know how to build things very well. They just have to have asphalt on them. Um, <laughs> but um, hey, they're getting into the concrete pavement. That's lately. true. They are. I take that back. I'm no, sorry. That's a step in the right direction. But um, I want to be optimistic, but I'm not. Um, but related to that is, you do have a transit uh, authority, the U- UDOT, that is completely unfamiliar with transit. That is now taking <laughs> over. Tra- uh, completely unfamiliar with mass transit. It's say. kind of and, a traditional state highway. Yes, department. And, exactly. And not to butt in here, but as it is well known by anyone who listens to this, I do work for UTA, mm-hmm. and so I have probably more of a pessimistic outlook on our current partnership with UDOT just because of some of the things I've worn working there. Like, mm-hmm. for example, uh, the Front Runner Forward project, mm-hmm. which is, you know, 10-some miles of double tracking. That's not that much on an existing rail corridor. Well, it sure, is, but it, it, it's important, and it, it can get us, it important. and it can get us 15-minute peak service, mm-hmm. which is quite something. But anyway... According to Jay Fox, the CEO of the Utah Transit Authority, or is CEO? He's in charge. He's, yeah. Um, we were about ready to lay track for that probably by the end of this year. Uh, now we're probably not going to be laying track until 24 or 25 because UDOT has never built tracks mm-hmm. before, and so UTA has to teach them how to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, and exactly. Like, in the long view, I'm going to be, like I said, cautiously optimistic. I am disappointed that it is holding up double tracking. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is related to problem number one in that Utah grew up when cars became a thing, mm. right? Again, this is not unique to Utah, no. but the metro area did not grow up until cars were well established as far as a mode of transportation. And therefore, we have built communities specifically around the car. Again, acknowledging that this is not a unique phenomenon to Utah, but that has, and you guys have talked about it, it's nothing, <laughs> yeah. it is nothing yep. new. Nothing um, episode. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but because of that, people have that mindset. So people elect people with that mindset. Mm. Uh, and so it becomes that hassle. Uh, and then another issue that I think is a very common one is, um, you know, we joke about the old grandma that doesn't know how the bus works, but there is, there's kind of this fear 
associated with, oh, well, I, I need to go to a spot and I need to wait and do I put the money in and oh, and then I go on the thing. And, and for a seasoned writer, right, we, we can kind of chuckle at that a little bit. I mean, say, as soon as you have your little tap card, you're basically yeah, set. Yeah, <laughs> well, um, I'm going to be honest. I'm still scared because I don't know how to put the bike on the bus. Yeah, no, and, yeah. That's, <laughs> and that's fair. But that is completely fair, right? Yeah. Um, and people you choose to use transit or not based on a thousand decisions, uh, one way or the other, right? And fear of, oh, I don't know how to put the bus on. Am I holding it up? You know, oh, I got to put the thing down. I got the thing up. Oh, is it secure? How you do know, I you, know when it comes? Yeah, like, and, and like you get on the bus and you see it start shaking. You're like, oh, no, it's going to fall off. <laughs> um, I don't know when the bus is coming. I look at the app. The app says it's not there. I, you know, what's going on? Like, all of these barriers, whereas key in car, car go, right? And well, so that well, I would I would say that driving in general is even more barriers, but it's a difference in how we learn how to do the mm-hmm. things because we're used to the barriers. Yeah. Like around driving. here, um, driver's ed is basically a mandatory oh, part yeah. of high school. I wouldn't oh, say basically; oh, it's yeah. absolutely mm-hmm. a mandatory part of high mm-hmm. school. But the most they'll tell you about trains is, hey, don't go around the big flashy mm-hmm. gates. They don't tell you how to get on the train, yeah. how to pay for the train. There's no transit. There's no transit training, really. Like, Which there really should be. There should be. I, I would, you could do that in an hour. I easy. would love to do that. I'd love to take a group of high school kids mm-hmm. and be like, hey, guys, guess what? We're going on a field trip on the bus today or yeah. something. And yeah. I mean, and UTA does have transit trainers, um, but they are very few and far between. They are generally limited to persons with disabilities. Yeah. And it's definitely not a standard part and of public education. Definitely not. There is there is no class on how to board the bus. Like, there are old-timey photos of they, they get this thing that's the size of a trolley and they go into the high school gymnasium and they push the trolley and they taught people how to hop on the trolley. Back that when they didn't was, stop. Back when they didn't, they would slow down and you had to, like, catch the trolley. I'm really into that. But that was because that was a legitimate life skill at the time. It was a legitimate life skill at the time to learn how to get on a trolley. It's obviously not one now. Now that we have trains that can stop. Yeah. Also ADA. Well, there's that <laughs> ADA minor detail right now. But, but that was a necessary life skill. And that's why driver's ed is a necessary course, is it's become a necessary life skill. If we can start to train people on how to ride the bus, how to get your bike secured, uh, how to tap on, how to tap off, how to ding the dinger, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, again, for the seasoned writer, for someone that's been doing it, you can kind of joke at that and you go, oh, how hard can it be? But we need, and again, this is where you two also focuses on the future writer, the person that is not currently taking the bus. And this is an area where we say, okay, I get it. It's fine. You don't know how to do it. Nothing wrong with that. You were never told. You were never taught. Yeah, UTA has some web pages, but... It's not quite the same thing uh, as actually like, here's where you wait for the bus stop. Here's what the signal, you know, here's what the numbers mean. Here's how you can like scan your QR code, all that good stuff. So going back to the original question, as far as barrier, because we don't teach those things, it is very difficult to get people onto transit in the first place. And then I'm firmly convinced for the most part, if you get people on the train, if you get people on a bus and they realize how easy it actually is, once you get over that initial fear, you're going to start developing people. And, and I'm going to wax poetic for a moment about Free Fair February. Ah, uh, <laughs> our love. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Where we got rid of, like, 75% of the barriers. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, and, and they were and they are barriers, right? Yeah. Fairs are a big barrier for a lot of people, either because they financially cannot afford to ride or, I already got gas in the car. Ah, it's fine. I already, you know... So why do I need to take the train? I got to go get a fare pay car. Yeah, I got to get a car and I got to go to the ticket booth or I got to do this or put the money in the thing. And yeah, and so by eliminating that, you do. You eliminate quite a few barriers. But I'm convinced, you true is convinced that there were four basic types of riders during Free Fair February, hmm. right? There were the people that were going to take the train, take the bus, no matter what. They were, they were already doing it. They just got a free month. Woo. I didn't have to reload my card. Yay. <laughs> um... The second writer was the occasional writer who, for whatever reason, doesn't take transit more often. It could be financial. They can't afford it. Or, you know, yeah, sometimes they drive to work. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they take the bus. Sometimes they don't. You eliminate that barrier. The third was the recreational dry- rider. A front runner on Saturday. Front runner on Saturday. On my trains. Nope, on Saturday. that's number four. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, but number three was um, the front runner on Saturdays. Two. 100% increase in ridership. Uh, 
hundred percent increase in ridership. The people That's want trains. The people do want trains. <laughs> Um, but these were the people that are like, I want to go to the aquarium and I don't want to drive. And now I don't have to pay to do it. So I'm not going to, and I'm going to get on the train and go down. Or, you know, I want to hop on the bus and, and, you know, maybe I'll head down to the movie theater or whatever. Right. So that was number three. And number four was just the pure novelty writer. Yeah. The person's like, ah, I've never been on a train before. Let's see what it's like. Right. And <laughs> personally, the, the, everyone who is critical of Free Fair February likes to really play up that demographic. Mm-hmm. But as a train host on Front Runner on Saturdays when we were doing, you know, 15,000 people mm-hmm. with our service, that was by far, by far, by far, by far the minority. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing is I believe that that novelty writer can turn into that recreational writer. Very quickly. Very quickly. That recreational tri- writer can turn into that occasional writer. And that occasional writer can turn into a frequent writer. And so all of that becomes possible through free fare because going back to eliminating barriers to getting on transit in the first place, seeing that is a thing you can do, that makes it a viable option for communities as we continue with free fare, um, if we continue with free fare, I know they're studying it now. Free fare forever. Free fare for forever. For, for. Um, <laughs> if we can handle those things, if we can attack those things, and if you true can be there as a voice for the future writer to eliminate those barriers, that is what we want to do as well. So long-winded answer, which I often do. Good. Um, but uh, it's content, right? Content. Yes, important. content. <laughs> yeah. We're going to make an hour and a half there podcast we go. today. Yeah. All right, that was that was brilliant. You're, just, yeah, you're definitely a political scientist. I'll, <laughs> I'll say that. Um, I'm very good on air. All right, so um, speaking of free fare, mm. UVX. The reason oh, so many people ride it is because it's free. Well, I know you guys love BRTs. We're not a fan. Uh. <laughs> For various reasons. But we do like to pay, poke fun at how they've kept UVX free. Yeah, Presumably no. out of fear of losing ridership. And they will. And it's not anything against the route per se. But, no. you know, I remember when I was in college, I didn't want to spend money if I didn't have to. Um, and sure, you know, BYU or, or Utah State could, you know, or not Utah State. Um, UVU. Utah, UVU. Um, there's too many calls. Back in my day. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, yeah, they can kick in and they can get rides, you know, pay for fares and that sort of stuff. But that's an additional barrier. You have to go and get it. Even if it's with your card or your, your student ID, it's still an additional barrier as opposed to just knowing you can hop on, right? And so BRT, love it or hate it, hate it, love it or hate <laughs> it. Um, Keeping that option free uh, and continuing to keep it free demonstrates the fact that, and it's not that UTA doesn't know it, but it demonstrates the fact that free fares drive ridership. Yeah. And free fares encourage ridership. And to make that system wide and across the board will only help in the future. Free fare benefits people both on the train and in their car next to the train. Do do you think that's the conclusion they're going to come to? Nope. 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 No. <laughs> they are going to come to the conclusion that it is too expensive, that frequency is more important, yeah. which frequency it is, is, which important. is important. It is more important. Is more important. Um, and I don't disagree with that. I think we should have higher frequency and free fare. What? Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Radical thought, right? But, if, but, if, but, if, but if you have, a, if, but you know, gun to my head, yeah, I would choose greater frequency and greater uh, coverage. But no, the conclusion they are going to come to is. It will be a thing that we'll do two weeks every once in a while when the air is really bad. or Which will not help because nope. you have to build sustained ridership mm-hmm. to fix the air. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Yeah. Um, is this more of like a budget thing on their part? No, I think it's so. The budget impact is minimal. So here's the thing is, in my opinion, policymakers are not going to support free fare because of that free, that word free. And you have to understand that we live in a very conservative state that does not like handouts except for when they do, um, <laughs> that, that sees that word free and they say, well, I don't want my tax dollars going towards that. My, I, 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 these, these freeloaders on the train, I don't, I don't care for it at all. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're more than happy to cut checks for roads they'll never drive on. They're more than happy to uh, build water projects for places they'll never go to. All, all these other <laughs> social things that we don't bat an eye at, but transit is, it's mass, it's, it's the people. And being a very 
individualistic uh, state as far as those sorts of things are concerned. We have this sense of community. It's really mixed in with this weird sense of individualism. I think it's in some ways unique to Utah. But they will say mass transit's for everybody else. I don't want to pay for everybody else. I'll pay for a road I'll never drive on because I know it's there. And I can go on it. And I can go on it if I want to. But if I want to catch a bus, I have to walk onto the sidewalk. Mm. If the sidewalk even exists. But I live in suburbia where we don't have that. So, no. I mean, ultimately, I don't think free fare should be a thing. Like, Representative Joel Briscoe, Democrat from Salt Lake, has been pushing for something like that for years. And every time, it doesn't even make it to committee. And I don't think it's going to be any different anytime soon. um, Because... People in St. George say, why should I pay for Salt Lake? And, you know, it's it's the way it is. So I think the ultimate conclusion will be, yeah, it's a great idea. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. <laughs> but it's a great idea. Meanwhile, let's keep expanding Legacy Highway. Let's keep expanding I-15. Let's keep expanding this road. Mountain View Corridor. Mountain View Corridor. Good stuff. So let's keep spending more money on like and let's, single lane expansions mm-hmm, of highways keep, yeah. than it would take to build a arson. world class mm-hmm. bike network. And in the let's valley. and let's continue to rubber stamp suburban communities built around the automobile that have minimum parking requirements and all that that is what is comfortable to them. That is what they like. And that's where U-True comes in and and starts to point these things out. Seven and actually actually challenge people to ask why you need a car. Well, I need a car because I can't get anywhere. Why is that? Well, it's because my community was built up around a car. Well, why is that? Well, it's because Racism. that's... Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that too. But, um, but, but to, to force policymakers to think a little bit more about transit as a viable option. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, they'll say it's a great idea and they will do nothing with it. Well... Just being honest. <laughs> yeah, well, doesn't we matter. appreciate it. Yeah. 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 That's unfortunate if you ask me, but I'm not in charge of anything yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keyword. Man, no, don't poli really. sci majors. I am poli sci major. I fully intend to rule the world. Um, <laughs> that's half the reason I went in. <laughs> I guess that that pretty much wraps up our discussion of you, true specifically. Yeah. But we just want to ask, sort of. Do you have any advice for people who are looking to get involved with transit advocacy, whether that's here in Utah or in other places around the country or even, you know, world? Yeah. Well, so obviously I would make the pitch. Uh, sign up for UTRUE, utru.org. Um, get on our mailing list. Participate in our activities. We, we are coming alive again. Um, so that's obviously the biggest pitch as far as locally. Um, and what I'll say is... Even if you drive a car, even if that's the only way you get around, mass transit still benefits you because it takes cars off the road. It, it makes it easier for you to get around. Uh, and so we encourage drivers to participate as well. Uh, as far as advocacy is concerned, I mean, there's the classic saying that all politics is local. All advocacy is local, uh, which is, again, why we are focusing on those community councils and things like that. Get involved. Show up to your community council meetings. It's very easy to find out where they are. You just Google, you know whatever your neighborhood is, community council meeting, and show up and listen and participate and and make your voice heard. U-True is is designed to be a statewide organization. We cannot show up to every single community council meeting. But if all of our members showed up to their respective community council meetings, real change can be made. And keep in mind that transit is local, it is regional, it is statewide, and it is national. And so that means that we have to work together in a unified vision of what our future can be. And and we may, you know, tell jokes and squabble and, and say things like, oh, a light rail is better than BRT or <laughs> blah, 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 or heavy rail is the only way to... And, and we can have those little squabbles, and that's fine. We can say microtransit's the way of the future because I'm a tech bro, and all of a sudden my Bitcoin is just tanked, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> but if we all approach it in this general, this general thrust of... Let's start building communities around people again. Let's start building communities that are focused on the individual and not the punk of metal that surrounds them. Then we can start to make changes. And then we can start talking to our neighbors in neighboring communities and our neighbors in neighboring cities and neighboring counties and neighboring states and build up a comprehensive network that allows you to theoretically step out of your home never get into a personal automobile 
and get to the other side of the country or the other side of the world, right? It's the, the infamous uh, transatlantic tunnel. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. But, but realistically, we can build communities where, I mean, it, it happens. And, and personally, I think the Wasatch Front is primed for such things. We are 120 miles long. We're 40 miles wide at the most. You can't expand I-15 forever. We have to have transit as an option. We have to have transit as an option. And a strong transit system, at least if we're talking about Utah, is the only way we can remain competitive economically, socially, uh, environmentally going forward. So as far as advocacy is concerned, as far as getting involved, show up. Show up. Make your voice heard, even if you quiver, and let people know that there are other options. There are other ways of thinking besides hopping in your car. If you can't get anywhere, you can't advance. So let's make a system that works for everybody. Let's do it. (laughs) Clap, clap, clap. Good. All right. So that concludes sort of the more um, structured-ish portion of the the episode. So now we figure we'll just go and blather on for a little bit if you like. I'll give you your cold. So so who (laughs) has the City Skylines route? Who is that? I am. Good man. I am City Skylines. Good. I, man, like when I was a kid, I grew up on like SimCity 2000, mm. man. <laughs> you laugh, man. That was high tech stuff that back is, in the day, though. man. It's like there were clouds. Um, <laughs> I know. Mm. No, my 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 significant other often will turn over and see me just like <laughs> expanding my city slightly. Yes. And saturated with bus stops. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely saturated. I know. It doesn't cost anything really in the game. No, so it's so cheap. All it the is bus so stops. cheap. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I got my whole. Oh, where is it? I don't know. It was a while back. It is Not a while back. There, there it is. is. Your little Cleveburg network. Cleveburg area rapid <laughs> transit. <laughs> I, I wonder what two cities it's inspired by. Hey, at least it's not Detroit. It's, <laughs> we're not Detroit. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I saw that and I had to have a good chuckle at that. Yeah. Uh, we could complain about microtransit. I, I'd be more I than would happy be to very happy course, to talk about microtransit because you're, yeah. you're an actual person Actually who is affected being by affected by the, yeah. by the microtransit replacements. Yeah. First, I have a question for you. Sure. Have you ever successfully ridden a, a microtransit? I have not. We have tried so many times. Well, so to be fair, it does not yet exist in Bountiful. So I, right. have, not, I have not actually taken it. Um, Last time I tried, they were out of vehicles. That, and that's the thing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, like they don't have enough. Uh, uh, and so, it's not like Uber. It's, they don't have it's like, like an we talked fleet. about last episode. Yeah. You can mm, the maximum theoretical amount of boardings you can get, and it's basically impossible to do it. Is four per hour. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it is <laughs> truly micro transit. So, here's my grand question, right? So, so the the biggest problem that UTA is facing right now is bus drivers people to actually make the things go, right? You know, the the labor market has become more competitive. They are a big hulking behemoth of an organization, so it takes time to raise wages and recruit and do all these things. And I get that. You know, there was a pandemic. They had to they had to shrink. It's, everybody had to. And then there are practical logistics, things that until I started doing this job, I didn't even think about. Like, oh, bus drivers go to the bathroom. Mm. They need a place to go to the bathroom, right? So you have to make stops where that happens, right? Um, this funny thing called actual infrastructure. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, but it is true though, and so some of that exists. But if we want to have new routes to new places, you need to put that in place. The little infrastructure, not not the big stuff where we're laying down miles of track. But hey, does this guy have a pace to pee? Needs to be figured out. And so UTA has this grand problem of not getting enough bus drivers now that people are starting to ride, ramp up again and, and starting to get back to. I mean, we're, we've got a long way to go, but we have this driver shortage, which means we can't expand the routes as much as we wanted to, and we can't have as high a frequency as we wanted to, and UTA has to make decisions based off of that. And yet, somehow, we have a private organization, a private company that we are subcontracting through that somehow is able to get people into cars, make them move, and somehow they're getting paid. Um, and so I have to ask myself, why can they afford to put people into a bunch of little cars, but we can't put people into a big bus? No, a big car. A big car. <laughs> big car. Lots of people. Go Zoom. Um, and so that I, I do have to wonder about that. The only place, the only place 
that I think microtransit is appropriate is in a community where no transit currently exists. That is the only place I could see it working. We're talking the Saratoga Springs of the world. We are talking the Benjamins in southern Utah County. We are talking the, you know, hoopers. We are talking Mm. those sorts of places where there truly is no transit options. It's something. And in that context, I think it's okay. Sure. It's like the old dial ride services from Mm -hmm. when, like, transit was at its really low point in the Mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, and 90s, where all these these rural counties, pretty much everywhere in the country, have some sort of dial ride service that you can get. Mm -hmm. But I I believe that it should be a crime to replace a fixed bus route Mm -hmm. with microtransit. Period. Full stop. Absolutely. For all the like five or ten different reasons we discussed mm-hmm. in depth. Yes. I mean, yes. just like that. It's ridiculous that they're planning to replace all of the bus service in Tula with mm-hmm. a microtransit. Mm-hmm. All of the bus service in Brigham City with a microtransit. Mm-hmm. And in Brigham. Yeah, in Brigham. <laughs> this this seems Except like a waste the, of perfectly um, good the one that goes there from budget. Oregon, yeah. Well, and, and and that's the thing, right? Is it all comes down to money. It always does, and. If you don't run any service, then it doesn't cost very much money. That's very true. Like, UTA doesn't pay very much for service in, you know, North Dakota, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Um, But transit is in, if you build it, they will come. Mm. Yes. And it has a massive multiplier effect. If one bus's route is great, two is even better, three is even better than that. And that is why I say microtransit is only appropriate in a community that has zero service and specifically connects with other routes. Otherwise, money could be spent elsewhere much, much better. Like mm-hmm. on bus routes. Like on bus routes. Like, exactly. you know, restoring 30-minute minimum frequency. Yes, something. that would be great. That would be fantastic. Be very, well, very so, like, I, I had to drive here and, uh, because, and, I, and I, you know, I know I said it already, but I had to drive here because I knew I'd talk a lot. <laughs> um, but I, if I miss my stop, if I miss my bus, I'm not getting home. If I leave here at... 7.30, I can make it home by 8.15. If I leave here at 7.31, I'm not getting home until 9.45. That is garbage. Criminal. It is absolutely garbage. And so what happens? I am forced to drive here um, because I want to get home, right? Yeah. <laughs> at some point, I'll stop talking so you guys can do the same. Well, but yeah, we got it easy. That's fine. Well, we're young. We, we're I, young. I stay up till three every night. So oh, man, I'm just biking downhill all the there way. There we down. go. <laughs> Me too. Um, but you're fortunate to have another option. And that's the thing, right? Like I have a privilege. I am privileged to be able to have a car as a backup. There are plenty of people who do not have that option. Yeah. Who either have to wake up early to catch their bus to get to work by eight. Uh, that's the other thing. It's like if I miss my bus, oh well, I'm lucky enough to be a manager. I can just stroll on in. That's great. It's fantastic, and I can work while I'm on the train. That doesn't work if you are working at McDonald's. That doesn't work if you're in the service industry. That doesn't work if you are the majority of workers. You have to be on time. Your bus has to arrive. And if not, you are late and your boss is on you. Yeah. And if you're 10 minutes late, you are either waiting 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half to get back home, or you have to call an Uber. Which is going to be expensive. That's going to be expensive. Yeah. Or you start walking. And that's even worse, right? Oh. And so, again, that's where we want to make sure that we are working on behalf of all transit riders. I want, tw- I would love 24-7, 365, 15 minute <laughs> for every bus route. Um, I know that's a very big pipe dream. I'm not going to pretend it's not. It's possible. It is possible, but we have to have the political will to do it. Yeah, and we can start with small steps, like the 30-minute minim- minimum mm-hmm. frequency system-wide that we that used to have. Be just, mm-hmm. like, Brilliant. incredibly transformative mm-hmm. for a lot of places, especially, like, like you were saying, southern Utah County, mm-hmm. north Davis, Weber areas. Like, and even in the Salt Lake Valley, like, well, over down in Kearns. West Jordan, Kearns, mm-hmm. you name it, they've got an hour to half hour bus grid, which really sucks because oh, the it's, frequency It's practically not useless. It's practically yeah. useless. And so, again, that, that is where that engagement with the policymakers is so important. You need to show them, you, the seven-day challenge is a good example. Show them why it doesn't work. That's where showing up to community councils and saying, this is why it works, this is why it doesn't, this is how it can work better, this is how it makes our community stronger. And then asking people who are running for office, do you support transit? 
If so, great. If not, why not? Why do you feel that that's not as important? And if you support transit, this is getting into not so much the external, we're all in this together, we're mm-hmm. going to build a better society. It's more of the internal, what kind of transit sure. do you want to build? Like, what are your transit priorities? Yeah, like, are I mean, you right now, I just want to make sure people get on a bus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We can have that like, conversation yeah. down the road, but you're absolutely right. Like, are your priorities maybe some signal priority, some bus lanes, some improved frequency here and there around the valley? Mm-hmm. Or are your priorities one of our least favorite things, a $200 million BRT project? I, right. I, <laughs> right. $100 million. And, 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 <laughs> painted lanes. Right. And I understand to some extent that it's a systemic problem with like capital versus operating funds, mm-hmm. yada, yada, yada. Bye, bye, bye. But it's still an issue that our policymakers have control over. It absolutely is. And that is why we need to have policymakers that are transit smart, that understand. Uh, the value of transit, and that we elect into office. Transit is not a Republican or Democrat issue. Transit is an issue of economics. Mm -hmm. And if you can get more people to get to more jobs, better jobs, spend more money at more places, and you can do that without having to build a highway that you need to replace every 15 years or expand every 20? Every 20? (laughs) You've seen I-15. Yeah, I know. Uh, (laughs) But if, if you can make... For, our, for the Republican policymakers out there, if you can make a policy argument that says, this saves money, this makes more money, this puts it in the pockets of the people, then they are going to see the benefit of it. On the Democratic side, if you say, this is a great equalizer, this is a way for people to have better access to better jobs that can lift themselves out of poverty, great. I don't think it's as hard of a sell for the average Democrat, but no. we live in a Republican state. We have to sell it to Republicans, and transit is sellable. It's good for everyone. It is it's good, a good product. for everything. It is a solid product. You know, it, it is a public good. And it's been proved it's, as that oh, <laughs> 100 years sake, ago. 100 years. Look, at, look at, like, as you were saying, it's not a left or right issue. I mean, look at, like, I don't know, let's say London, where, like, Boris Johnson mm-hmm. is probably real proud that his government, when he was mayor of London, started work on Crossrail. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, yeah, anywhere in the world, it's not an issue except... Yeah. Kind of here. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, is it's become politicized because it has the word mass and transit, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know what? If they want to go cut a ribbon, great. Have at it. I don't care. But we also need to realize that ribbon cutting for, you know, double tracking, and let's just say double tracking all the way from Brigham City down to Benjamin. If you want to cut the, <laughs> if you want to cut the ribbon on that, great. But realize that digging a hole and putting in a bus stop and a pole there is just as important. Can we normalize ribbon yeah, we cuttings ribbon cut bus on stops? bus stops? Oh, sure. I, I'll say go for it. Like, I'll, hell, I'll spring for the ribbon. Like, <laughs> like if, if we want to have go all along a bus route and have a little ribbon around each one of them and just snip, and the mayor snip, just snip, gets snip, to go. Snip. How, about, how about this? Um, government funds UTA to improve bus stops, sure. um, improve accessibility, add shelters, timetables, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. UCRU funds ribbon. Okay. And, and big scissors. And big scissors and big scissors. So we're getting into, we're a 501c3 and we're running into like political activity. We'll have to set up a pack or something like that. The ribbon cutting pack. That's what we'll call it. Utah ribbon the U True ribbon cutting pack. We'll get you the biggest scissors, the finest ribbon. We'll even give you like a little, we'll give you a real big medal that says friend of transit. Yeah, yeah you we'll do it. Yeah. We'll be great. I got all right, so you need to donate to U True in order to make. Well, technically, you can't if it's political. Still, donate to U True. I think that's a wise. Yeah, give thing. them money. Give, yeah. us, give them money. We give don't need money. money. Give them money. No, you guys need money too. We I need remember. Money I, I remember being a podcast. <laughs> you guys need money too. Mm. Um, but but all all politics is local. All action is local, and transit is local. Mm. Get involved. Yeah. Absolutely, get involved. Make that change. You can make it happen. Okay, so I. Yes, that's probably it. Thank you yeah. so much for coming on, Curtis. It's Absolutely. It's a joy Thank to listen you. to you. Absolutely. <laughs> You're also very good on air. Uh, well, I mean, I did have, you know, I, I blather on very well. Um, I'll just I'll just make the final pitch again. Um, follow us. Uh, first of all, get on our mailing list. Uh, just go to utrue.org, U-T-R-U, Utah Transit Riders Union.org. Follow us on, U-tru- or follow us on Twitter. 
uh, so that we have all the snarky memes. Yes. Uh, it is Ride U True, U T R U. We we, <laughs> purpose, we purposely tried to hijack <laughs> Ride U T A a little bit there. I hope you've got some more exciting tweets than they do. I mean, as as great as the Garth Brooks concert is. Uh, oh, I, <laughs> oh I, man, no, you did not want to know that was a I'm headache. I'm sure it was. Um, <laughs> we have slightly snarkier, but we also have practical tweets as well. So yes. follow us there. We're working on getting a TikTok so that you can watch oh, me do all the dances. Oh, uh, I will do all the dances. We're working on getting them. So follow us on the socials. Uh, donate to you, True. Get on our mailing list. Um, we are building. Now is the great time to kind of get reestablished, um, get involved in the community, keep an eye out for those community trainings. They will be coming uh, probably, hopefully, later in the year, knock on wood, uh, so that people are uh, good and ready with their new elected officials, ready to talk to them, ready to engage. Um, so, yeah, that's the pitch. Get involved. Make a change. Yeah, do what he says. Um, Let's go. <laughs> convert all of your friends and family into U-True members. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Yeah.